That's quantity. Now we want to go to quality. I'm on page number nine. Three types of calls you need to make in the field with your salespeople. There's a joint call, a training call, and a coaching call. Three very distinctly different types of calls. All of them have their benefit. Wayne's my sales guy over there. I'm a sales manager and I say, hey Wayne, pick a day in the next two weeks and we'll go out in the field and do joint calls together. Remember what a joint call is? That's where we equally participate in the call. You got the eye contact, you're asking the questions, I'm taking notes, then I hear something you don't pick up on, then I come in and I ask the questions and we ham and egg it. Not only a great learning opportunity, but a great selling opportunity is the joint call. At the end of the joint call, we debrief. Hey, Wayne, how'd you think it went in there? What'd you think went well? What'd you think didn't go so well? When you said this, where were you headed with that? And what do we need to do going forward to win over the account? That is a great call to be made. And if I find sales managers making any calls in the field with their people, they tend to be joint calls. But you miss the training. Hey, Wayne, pick a day in the next couple weeks. Let's go on my training calls together. Remember what that is. That's where I, the sales manager, make the call. And you, the sales guy, watch me. And I'm not saying to do what I do, I just want you to see somebody else in action. At the end of every call, we debrief. What did you like? What did you not like? What did you not understand? What do you do different than I do? When I said this, where was I headed with it? And what do we need to do going forward to win over the account? That's a great call too. But I'll tell you my personal favorite, coaching. I think it's my personal favorite because very few people do it and those that do it mess it up. Let's go out and make some calls, coaching calls in the next couple weeks. Pick a day and remember what that is. That's where you the salesperson make the call and I ride silent shotgun. And if you've ever done it, there's a one word description of this call. Hard. <laughs> it's hard. Wayne and I are out on the call and it's coaching day. And it couldn't be going better. He's 40% through the call and the customer prospect is waving flags saying, I'm in, whatever you want me to sign, I'll sign right now. He sees the flags and in his head says, this call couldn't be going better. Look at those flags. I'm only 40% through and I'm gonna give them the full Monty. <laughs> And my leg isn't long enough to kick him and say, yo, 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 out, get the paperwork signed and leave. And you can't take over the call. And I'll make it worse. How about this? We're on coaching day. He's in front of a hot prospect and is blowing it from moment one. I cannot and will not take over the call. And I know there are people in here and their heads going, well, you dumbass, I'd take over that call. I've never been on one like that. And I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> if I white knight that call, what's he going to do when I'm not there tomorrow and the next day and the next day? And what I would have done if I took over that call is I would have confused what my job was because a sales manager's job is not to close deals. It is not to grow sales. It's to grow sales people in quantity and quality. And there's something really important up on that presentation there that very few people see. I see it, it's glaring. No green lines on the coaching. You know what that meant? No debrief at the end of a coaching call. What I tell Wayne is, don't ask me at the end of every call how you did. We're on coaching day. We're going to do four calls together and at the end of the four calls, we'll debrief then. If I debrief at the end of the first coaching call, what's he doing the second? He adjusts. He changes his behavior. I, I, I debrief on the second one. He's like a basket case on the third one. What I want to know is what is he like when I'm not there? And I suggest this. We should be doing a blend of joint training and coaching calls and here's my metric. A minimum of four hours a month per salesperson on this task. So if you had 10 salespeople and you were doing four hours a month on each guy, 40 hours a month just here. 
And here's the problem. If you're committing any one of the three sins, there's no way that you can get that done. And as a result, the guy that does get this done is going to take your company out back and spank you on the bare bottom. And I've been doing it my whole life. Because I know the difference between urgency and importance. And that's important. Sports teams do this. They don't send their people out into the field without training and practice. We do it all the time. Look at the next sheet on the next page. I just came out of New York this week and uh, I had a workshop. We did role practice. This was rated as one of the highest things that went on in the session. And you don't need me to come into your company to do this. I'm going to show you how to do it without me. First thing that I want to point out to you on this page is it doesn't say role play, it says role practice. People don't, let, don't learn to get better by playing, they get better by practicing. The pro golf tour. The guys that win the most money and a higher percentage of the tournaments they enter spend less of their time playing tournaments and more of their time practicing. It's the mediocre golfers on the Pro Tour that are going from one tournament to another hoping and praying to make the cut and therefore they don't practice and they don't do it. The guys that arrive by jet have the jets because they've won and they've won because they practice. Um, it, you know, Tiger's struggling, right? And he's been struggling for a few years. But last year people forget he was the golfer of the year as voted on by his peers and he won four tournaments. But what's interesting about that is that over the last decade, there's clearly he's been the premier golfer. And he's won more money and more tournaments. And he plays in less tournaments. And the thing that really makes him different is he practices. Enormous amounts of practice. So here's how we did it in New York this past week and everywhere that I do this. We take the room and we divide them up amongst three, into threesomes. And then we ask them to take a number one, number two, number three. In your notes, here's what we say. Number one, you're going to be the prospect. Number two, you're going to be the salesperson. And number three, you're going to be the observer. Now when I give you the green light, I want number two, the salesperson, to turn to not the other two people and tell them a lot of stuff. One, I want you to tell them the business you're in. Second, I want you to tell them the purpose of the call. How many times have I gotten out in the field with a salesperson, walked halfway up to the prospect's place of business, turned to them halfway up and say, what's the purpose of the call? Purpose? What do you mean purpose? How the heck will you know whether you're a success if you have no idea what the purpose is going in? In my notes, you know what I wrote down? Never make a call without a purpose. Never make a call without a purpose. So, I want you to tell them the business you're in, I want you to tell them the purpose of the call. Next thing I want you to tell them, is it an over the phone call or is it face to face? Is it a first call? Is it a cold call? Is it a call where you expect to get an order? Basically, I want you to set the scene and then once the scene is set, I want you to do the call. Prospect. I do not want you to be the prospect from hell, nor do I want you to be a cupcake. I want you to be real. And the observer has the hardest of the three jobs. They have four tasks. First one might be the most difficult for them. Zip your lip. No talking. None. None, none, none. Only thing I want out of the observer is three columns of notes. Here's the notes. Things you see and hear on the call you like. Things you see and hear on the call that aren't so good. And then the most important notes of all, suggestions for improvement. Things you like, things you didn't, suggestions for improvement, everybody have their assignment, go, boom! And I let the room go. And then the volume of noise goes down and I say, okay, debrief. What you like, didn't like, suggestion for improvement, debrief. Volume goes down. It takes me about 15 minutes. At the end of 15 minutes in a room just like this, I then say to my audience, how many people in position two got feedback that they learned something that could make them be better as a salesperson and help them make more income. Every number two's hand up in the room. Bang, time out. So in this artificial environment in less than 15 minutes, 
You're saying you got better at what you do for a living? Perfect. We'll do this three times a week. Forever! <laughs> and imagine how good we'll be. We then change hats. Number one becomes the observer. Number two becomes the prospect. Number three becomes the salesperson, a whole new case. We do it the same way, and then we do it a third time. It takes me 45 to 60 minutes to make it through all three sectors. Everywhere we go in the world, there are two big takeaways that come out of this exercise. First takeaway. I don't know what it's like over in that threesome, I don't know what it's like back there, but I'll tell you in our threesome, the third time we did it, we were way better than the first. Did you just say in this artificial environment you got better at what you do for a living? Yeah. Perfect. We'll do this three times a week forever. Tiger Woods is still practicing. You know, when Jerry Rice played for the San Francisco 49ers, I think he was the best receiver in all of football. He was also the first guy on the practice field and the last guy to leave it every day. When Michael Jordan was at the Bulls and they won all those championships, first guy on the practice court, last guy to leave it. There was a connection between practice and performance. If your salespeople are not practicing in some way inside your company, tell me where you're practicing. Yeah, on the real, real world in front of the prospect. Hey, four o'clock, shit, we can practice on another one. Holy crap, tell me what winning sports team is practicing on real deals. Hey, coach, uh, coach, when, when, when are we going to practice? Well, let me see. Oh, look, we got a game tomorrow. We'll practice on them. <laughs> really? Sports teams are run better than businesses. They would never put a person out on the ice, out on the court, out on the field without practicing. You're putting your people out in the field and you're practicing on this. No wonder we don't want to meet with salespeople. I go build all these companies. Do you know how many salespeople have called on me? No wonder I have gatekeepers keeping, me, uh, keeping them out. What do, you, what do you expect? You think I have a conversation with a salesperson once 30 minutes of my time? Well, what, why am I going to give you 30 minutes of my time? Well, I mean, it, it, you want the truth? Yeah, give me the truth. I thought I'd swing by and practice on you. Now, if I took 20, 30, 40 appointments a day, what, for each clown to come in and practice on me? Because if I asked them, well, how often do you practice and where do you practice and how do you practice, they'd go, oh, I ain't got any practice. Yeah. I'm just making this crap up as I go along. <laughs> but it, it's consistent in the company because the leader of the company doesn't know what the hell he or she's doing either. We're all just making it all up. <laughs> It's funny, but it's sad, isn't it? By the way, they wear all three hats. Salesperson, prospect, and observer. And when they wear all three, then I say, which one did you learn the most wearing? What do you think I hear most, most often? Observer. We learn more by being the observer. So here's my advice to you. Quit putting salespeople out in the field on their own prematurely. You know what you should do? Spend the first 30 days and link them up with the top producers. Hook them up to their hip and find out what the top people are doing. The top people are the same every year. They must be doing something different. And here's what I can tell you about role practice. If you don't schedule it, it won't get done. If you don't schedule it, it will not get done. When I spoke about sales to the salespeople this morning, did I talk about this page right here? No, right? You know why I didn't? Because they wouldn't do it. The best people in life practice. We don't practice. And then we wonder why we're not getting the results. This is a mystery to me. I don't think it's very difficult to run a successful business. All I think you have to do is I think you have to be disciplined and follow the systems and processes for success. That's it. It's all basics. Jim Collins and I... You know Jim Collins, good to great, all that, right? Two years ago, he and I toured Australia together. And 
I told him his most recent book, Great by Choice, was one of my favorites. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. Uh, here's what Jim did. He, he, he studied companies that year after year after year had increasing sales. It didn't matter what was going on in their industry. It didn't matter what was going on in the economy. Year after year, year after year, increasing sales. And once he found that population of companies, he tried to look and see what was it that they might have had in common. And here's what he found. Systems and processes focused on the basics. Nothing fancy. Systems and processes focused on the basics. You know one of the companies that it's in great by choice? Southwest Airlines. So now let's think about Southwest Airlines. They fly one airplane. One type of airplane. So if the airplane breaks down, they, then they have a replacement there at the airport. They can push it right into the gate and the crew is certified to fly on that plane. But if I'm the American Airlines and I fly 22 planes, different types, the crews have to be okayed and approved for every one of those planes. So my plane breaks down, they've got an alternative plane, they pull that into the gate, and now the crew may not be eligible. So I as a passenger get inconvenienced and the company loses money because of it because they had to put me up in the hotel. I'm pissed, they're pissed, we're all pissed. You fly one plane, you know what you can do? You can store spare parts at every one of the airports because you don't have to put spare parts for 22 planes. You just have to put them for one type of plane. And when you instruct your people, they only have to learn one type of plane. It's all very basic and it's a system and a process. That's what he found. And my stuff is the same way. It's systems and processes of the simple basics and now you do the basics and you win the game. Like page 11. At the very bottom of the page, you circle that, there's hardly anything that goes on on the sales call that you couldn't anticipate before you get there. As a result, there's no reason to not be better prepared. I was in New York the other day, and in my audience, there was a company that had seven people from the same company. So I had them stand up in front of the room, there were about a hundred of us. And I said, remind everybody what your company does, and they reminded them what their company did, and I said, why should I do business with your company? First guy said, experience. Next guy said, knowledgeable. Another guy said, lots of things to choose from. Another one said, uh, good, good customer service. Another guy said, me, um, and it just went on. And I said, well, that's, that's an interesting list. So if your company wasn't here, but your competitor X was, and I had them stand up, would they say they're experienced? Knowledgeable, choice, good customer service. Me. You gave me nothing different than the other guys. If your sales force doesn't know what your unique selling proposition is, if your sales force doesn't know what separates you from your competitors, how do you expect the buyer to know? How do you expect the prospect to know? Why should I pick you? What's special about you and your company? Do you think that when I had your competitor X stand up, they'd say, why should you do business with company X? We're inexperienced, we don't know anything, we don't have anything to choose from, we have crappy customer service, and I could give a damn. Well, that's not true. So let me give you the antidote to that problem. It's a little tiny book, bless you, called Creating Competitive Advantage. It's written by a woman by the name of Janie Smith, J-A-Y-N-I-E, J-A-Y-N-I-E, Janie Smith. Janie Smith calls me up. She lives in Florida. I live in California. She says, hey, Jack, anywhere in the United States continental, 48 states, tell me when, tell me where, I want to meet up with you for an hour, breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatever. I've written a book called Creating Competitive Advantage. I said, Janie, I know who you are and I know that you've written that book. 
but you haven't told me why I want to meet with you. And she said, well, it's not about you. It's about me. What I'm trying to figure out is, you sell way more of my books than I sell. And I want to know how you do that. I said, well, I speak more frequently and I have bigger audiences, so that's how I do it. But every audience I'm in front of, I mention your book. So it's simple. So we don't need to meet? You got the answer. She said, no, no, I still want to meet with you. I said, all right, um, here's my schedule, and we met. We met up in uh, Times Square for breakfast at the Marriott. And um, you know what Janie taught me that day? Remember that list up there? I did just as poorly. She said, you need help. You should have a better answer than what you just gave me on why people should pick you. So she helped me. And um, you have the results in front of you on the back of this business card. And on the back of the business card, there's something there called Why Jack Daily. There are 10 bullet points. Well, the reason you should pick me to do sales training for your company is because I built six companies from scratch in the national firms. One of my companies was Inc. number 10 on the Inc. 500 with 10,100% growth and Ernst & Young honored us as Entrepreneur of the Year. I was Speaker in the Year in Australia and Speaker of the Year in the UK. I have a Bachelor's degree in Accounting and Master's in Business. I was a captain in the U.S. Army and I've done Ironmans all over the world and competed successfully in the Ironman World Championship. You see, what the back of that card says is Jack Daly produces results. Now, if you were going to hire somebody to do sales training in your company, I think you should talk to other people besides me. And when you make it to the final three, I think in, the office, in your office all by yourself, you're going to say, why this guy versus this guy versus this guy? Well, here's why me. Now, if you decide to not go with me, I'm cool with that. Just do me one favor. Email me or call me and let me know who you pick because I, I want to meet that guy. <laughs> that list was way better than I just put up there. Here's what Janie says. Come up with what really stands you apart and be very specific about it and make it difficult for them to choose anybody but you. Why should we not do this? None, n n hardly anybody in the world does this page number 11. And you know why? Because you can have a business and not do this. It's not urgent, just important. <coughs> On page number 12, I put some names of books here. I want to take you through those and just so you can make some shorthand notes. I wouldn't build a business without reading number two. Michael Gerber wrote the quintessential guide to building a successful entrepreneurially driven company called the E-Myth Revisited. Can't imagine building a business and not having read the E-Myth. It is how to scale. If you want to talk about culture, the best books that I've found on culture are three and four, Delivering Happiness and Nuts. Delivering Happiness tells you how Tony Shea did it at Zappos. In their 10th year of business, they sold the company for $1.2 billion. Jeff Bezos bought the company, said he bought it for its culture. And Nuts is how Southwest Airlines built their culture. Seven, Creating Competitive Advantage, that's the book I just told you about in Janie's. Nine, Steve Jobs, written by Walter Isaacson, that's his biography and that was the perception of value and where I come from there. And number ten, Vern Harnish, I can't imagine a business not having read Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. In there, he has a dashboard report that is one page that is stellar. You can wake up in the morning, turn your computer on, look at this page and know where you need to focus that day because it's glaring what needs attention. 17, I mentioned it this morning, here it is again. The very best sales book ever written specifically on sales is written by Pat Lencioni called Getting Naked. And the essence of that book, when you care more about the customer than you do about the sell, you will sell more than anyone else out there. 19, I mentioned it this morning, Tony Alessandra's classic work for salespeople, The Platinum Rule, which basically says, we all know the golden rule, treat people like you want to be treated. Tony says, turn it into platinum and treat them the way they want to be treated. 
Adjust your style to be more in alignment with the person that you're calling on. The very best salespeople are like chameleons and they morph into being more like the target. And then, if you ever want your head, that 50% that requires success, if you want this to really get genned up and realize all of what you can do, then I recommend 21. And that's Shackleton's journey to, to Antarctica endurance. When I was 25% through that book, I said to myself, how can there be three quarters of a book left? The guy has already endured about as much as a human being can endure. And it's just an amazing, amazing adventure. And those are just a few of the books that I recommend. I read about 30 books a year. So in my newsletter, I have a recommendation monthly of a book that I think is worth your while. Okay? Uh, page number 13. I'm going to close with that. I will make a note as I did this morning with the group this morning. First note that I'll make, a reminder. If you want the newsletter, I need a business card. Okay? Second note, on page number 14, this is a partial list of all of the products that I have. You can find the complete list on my website. Audios, videos, books. Now, the important part on that page is what's in the dotted lines on the far left. You go online, anything you want to make an investment in, you punch in the promo box the word value, V-A-L-U-E, and it automatically will deduct 25% from the list price. It's my courtesy to you as a result of me being here today. All right? So that was it, and I need to go back to 13, and then we'll close with that. So 31 years ago, I decided that I wanted to do the Ironman, and I wanted to do it in Hawaii in the World Championship. And November 12th, 2013, I actually crossed the finish line in Hawaii in the Ironman World Championship. It's a very big moment for me and I carry this medal everywhere with me. It will not leave me and I can't make it through security in the airports without it. I get frisked on this thing every single time and then they have to pull it and fail it and all that and then I've had many TSA agents tell me this thing is bigger and better looking than an Olympic medal. Um, there are people that lose their businesses trying to get into that race. There are people that lose their spouses trying to get into that race. It is very, very difficult. Um, there, are, uh, there are about 400,000 people in the world today that compete in triathlons. There are 2,000 that make it into that race. It is rare, rare air. It's even more mind-blowing to realize that I raced that race at 64 years old and at 57 years old I did not know how to swim. And it starts with a 2.4 mile ocean swim followed by a 112 mile bike followed by a 26.2 mile run for a total of 140.6 miles in some of the harshest conditions you could race in. Tumultuous seas, searing weather, hot, humid off of the lava rocks, temperatures in the triple digits, and winds that are just howling. I took a big, big house and I rented it for two weeks. I invited friends and family to be there with me to celebrate. We spent four days before the race there and ten after. Most everybody that was at the race that stayed there for two weeks spent ten days before acclimating to the weather and a couple days afterwards, I decided I wasn't going to win that race. All I wanted to do was finish it. But what I really wanted to do was party hardy when I was done. <laughs> so we put most of the days after the race on there. I had 10 days to reflect sitting in the beach chair about my journey. And what I learned in doing this Ironman are seven things that I'd like to share with you. And the seven things that I learned in my Ironman journey fit very nicely in building a business. So here's what they are. Vision. You can't build it unless you know what you're building. You can't get to your destination unless you know what it is. I had clarity of vision from 31 years ago, me racing down Ali Drive to thousands of people cheering 
with Mike Riley, the voice of Iron Man, saying, Jack Daly, you are an Iron Man. And by the way, every single one of my businesses, I had a clear vision of what it was when it was going to be done. First item is vision. Second, you can't be successful in the Iron Man without a playbook. And yeah, I don't believe you can be successful in your business without a playbook. What is your game plan? What is your playbook? In writing. What are the systems and processes of success for your business? Third, a system of measurement. Because things that get measured get done. I invite you all to go to my website at jackdaily.net and pull off of there a document called Year in Review. Year in Review 2013. It's about a five page, five page single page document, single space document that I provide to the five people that hold me accountable to my personal goals. And when you see how much I measure in my personal life, I want you to imagine what I do in my business. Things that get measured get done. Fourth, the importance of coaches. So everybody here knows that I hired a swim coach so that I could learn to swim. Because it would make more sense to do it that way than to just jump in the pool and flail around. You know how many business people are jumping in the pool and flailing around in their business as opposed to getting a coach? But what I didn't tell you was, I have a swim coach, I have a bike coach, I have a run coach, I have an overall triathlon coach, I have a nutritionist coach, and I have a strength training coach. I have six coaches to get me to the Ironman. And if you caught what I was saying earlier, I have five coaches that I call the board of directors of my life that hold me accountable on the personal goals that I have. And I have three coaches on my business. Model the masters. Somebody's already figured this game out. Take the shortcut and learn from them. Who are your coaches? Who are you leveraging and trading off of the jewels that they've learned to save you and give you an expedited journey? I think I'm up to number five. And number five would be train and practice. Practice and train. You're going to do 140.6 miles in an Ironman race. Anybody think they're going to get there without practicing and training? Why, why would you think that you could build a business without practicing and training? Sounds just very foolhardy. The sixth one is a stretch for some people in the business, but not on the Ironman. The sixth one is nutrition and fitness. I'll be done in a minute if that's for me. Um, Iron Man Day. Takes me about 13 hours to get it done. I drop between 12 to 14,000 calories that day. That's what I expend. Your body holds about 2,800. If you don't get ahead of the game, you will die. I didn't, I didn't just polarize it. That's just facts. You don't replenish the calories and get there before they run out, you die. I gotta tell you something. I think what you do in your world is harder than Iron Man. Let me tell you why. Iron Man starts at seven o'clock in the morning, you need to be done by midnight, 17 hours, that's the max. Otherwise you don't exist. And when you're done, they drop a medal on you and everybody celebrates the hell out of you. And then and the next day, you take off. You take off a bunch of days. You know what you do? You do that every single day and you get up and do your Ironman every day. And you know what? As a salesperson, you're tons of rejection. And as a business owner and as a business leader, there's tremendous problems. Every one of my businesses, I've had problems. Every one of my Ironmans, I've had challenges. I ran, I raced the uh, Phoenix Ironman. At the end of the first of three loops on the bike, I, I heard the announcer say, there goes Jack Daly racing comfortably in first in his age group. Do you know if I finished first in my age group five years ago, I would have made Hawaii five years ago? Problem was there were two more laps on the bike and I had three flats. And you want to quit. 
I've never had an Ironman race where I didn't want to quit. And guess what? I never had a business where I didn't want to quit. It's so easy for me to stand up in front of you and tell you all my successes. Went from four people to 750 people. In my first three years, I made $42 million of earnings. Take that. Inc. number 10 on the Inc. 500 with 10,100% growth. Take that. You know, speakers, you know what they don't do? They don't tell you things like this. You know that Inc. number 10 company that was all heralded all over the place and won Entrepreneur of the Year honors from Ernst & Young? Within a year after winning those awards, I stood in front of 275 employees and told 240 of them to clean out their desk and go home by noon. Somehow, we forget to tell people those stories. You want to quit. You want to quit. I can tell you this, because I'm fit and take care of myself, I can take rejection a lot better than most people. I can take disappointments better than most people. I can take hurdles better than most people. I can, I can get up earlier than most people. I can work later than most people. And I can work smarter the time I'm awake. I have a competitive advantage because I have taken care of myself. And I've done it intentionally. I'm 65 years old and all of my doctors that meet with me on a regular basis last year said that I am the equivalent of a 37-year-old man. That's not by accident, that's by design. It's by discipline. My two children are 35 and 42 and they hear it from me all the time. I will kick your ass. I have a competitive advantage. The last of the seven lessons learned is attitude. Everybody talks about the Ironman being 140.6 miles. I think it should be 140.6 plus 6 inches. And that 6 inches is right here. I think that's half the race. We were talking about this. Wayne and Gary and I were talking about this at lunch break. One of my favorite things in the Ironman is they put your age and magic marker on the back of this calf. Out of 2,000 racers, there ain't 20 guys older than me. That's 1,980 people with a smaller number. I've done 67 marathons. I've run Boston three times. I'll run it again this year. I'm a pretty high-performing athlete when it comes to running. I know I'm going to be slower than most out of the water. I just learned to swim a few years ago. I had to somehow reconfigure my head attitudinally to not be depressed when I came out of the water because we all stage our bikes together, right? And I'm going to be one of the last guys out of the water. So what I had to do was reframe my head to make number seven work for me. And you know what I reframed it at? I decided that I felt bad for the guy who came out of the water first. I want you to think about that. How hard it was for him to find his bike. <laughs> Mine was all there by itself. <laughs> and you know, as I put my chin strap on my helmet on, as I was leaving T1 to go out and do that bike race, I thought of another positive thing. No one can pass me. <laughs> so all I did in that race is race the guy in front of me. I forgot about everybody else. All I wanted to do was pass that guy in front of me. And once I got to him and passed him, then I looked for the next one to take down. And I passed a few along the way. And then I get to the run. And now almost everybody's got a lower number on that leg than me. And I nuzzle up behind them. And I see that 37. And I got this 65 back there. And I get and draft right behind them get a little bit more air in me and then I take the pass I pause just briefly so he can look at the number <laughs> and then I rip his heart right out of his chest <laughs> and look for the next victim <laughs> and do you know when I start thinking about all what I just discussed at 650 in the morning right before they knock that gun and start that swim because attitudinally I am so in the game. I am going to take you down. Do you know in New Zealand Ironman, I passed 400 competitors. 400 people looked at the back of that leg. Take that. 
you get those seven lessons down, whether you're a salesperson or you're a business owner or a business leader, you're going to run a successful business. How many people felt like the afternoon went pretty by pretty fast? Okay, all right. You have a good time today? Yes. Did you get a few ideas that could help you run a better business? Yes. Thank, thank you for inviting me to your parishes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to Wayne, my Sherpa, and thanks to Gary over there for putting it all together. Thank you, guys. We are dismissed unless you have some questions you want to ask. Yes, sir. I have been trying to be the CEO and the salesman for the last three years. It's a terrible life, Jerry. I'm a better sales manager than I am a CEO. Yeah. That's all I've ever done. And I guess I can't, I don't think I can afford. Ah, you can't afford not to. And so, um, you know what? I think when I say Apple, people say Steve Jobs. When I say Steve Jobs, they say Apple. Like, he was, he was the man, right? How much of Apple do you think he owned when he died? How much? How much? Take a guess. What percentage? 10%. Less. Single digits. Bill Gates is often the number one or two richest person in the world. He got his wealth from Microsoft. How much of Microsoft, what percent of Microsoft do you think Bill Gates has? 60%. Less than 10%. Single digit. What happens with you guys that are owning your businesses is you're, you're unwilling to give up a little piece of the action. See, here's where I come from. I, I'd rather have 10% of the lemonade market worldwide than 100% of the lemonade stand in front of my parents' house. You got your lemonade stand in front of your house and you got 100% of it and you ain't going to give up any of it so that somebody could take you to another place of grandeur. See, I'm not available, but you hire a guy like me, I'll scale your, scale your company, we'll make what you got right now insignificant, and what you pay me in terms of percentage of ownership, I'm going to earn by way of the growth of the company, or I'm not going to get paid. And if I ain't willing enough to go in and give it for the ownership and forget about the compensation, I, we'll get the comp done later. I don't care about the comp, I want to grow this puppy. That's the guy you're looking for. Should I look for... Guy that's already been there, done that. Keep the sales manager job, own the company, hire yourself a CEO, and give them a split. How do you find those people? Network. Put, your, put, put it out there. Um, it, it, you can network with me. Everybody has their business card. You email me. You tell me what your situation is. Tell me what you're looking for, and I'll see what I can do for you. Okay? That's, part, that's called networking. We're good. See you.